Hi, everyone. Welcome to another recorded book discussion between the Honoris Book Club and Ann Arbor District Library. Tonight, we will be discussing a collection of short stories called After Parties, and this is by Anthony Biesna So. Um, before we get started, we'll just do a quick introduction. I can start and a visual description if you're comfortable. So my name is Lucy. I am a library tech at the Ann Arbor District Library. I work in the youth department doing story times and youth programs, but I do a lot of book discussions and adult discussions as well. I'm a 51 year old female, white with brown hair that is up right now and glasses and a green sweater sitting in front of a stack of books. I'll go ahead. I'm Beth. I'm also a library tech uh, in the outreach on the outreach team of the Ann Arbor District Library. And um, so we do a lot of different things. Um, I am a 62 year old woman with white woman. I'm wearing a black shirt with a white fuzzy sweater and a bunch of plants behind me and a and a window. And my cat wants me to let her out of the room. So I, I may disappear a moment. Hi, my name is Amanda. I'm also a library technician at AADL. I work in the youth department. I do programming for all ages though, and I really enjoy taking part in these book discussions. I am a middle-aged white woman. I have um, kind of medium length brown wavy hair. I'm wearing glasses, a gray sweatshirt, and I'm sitting in front of a dimly lit white room with plants and books set up all around. My name is Christopher, and I'm also a library tech. I work in the youth department, and I do a lot of programs and love being a part of these book discussions when I have the chance. I'm an aging uh, white man with glasses wearing a checked quilted shirt in front of a uh, brick wall. I'm Emily. I am a librarian at AADL. I uh, manage the kids fiction collection, but I do mostly programming for adults. I'm a white woman in my mid 30s with long reddish hair that's currently in one braid over one shoulder. I am wearing a flower printed dress. I'm sitting in front of a mostly white wall with a print of Matisse's goldfish in front of me or behind me. And I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I'm Anne, and I am a book processor slash shelver at the Westgate branch primarily, although I've worked at all of the branches over the years. Um, I am a middle-aged white woman with uh, shoulder-length brown hair. I've got glasses. I'm heavy set. Um, I'm wearing a black cardigan over a purple V-neck sitting in front of a uh, white pantry doors. Hi folks, I'm Fatima Hawk. I am a co-facilitator of the Unerased Book Club. I am a South Asian woman in her mid thirties uh, with black hair parted down the middle and a ponytail and wearing a black t-shirt in front of a digital background of a part of the Chittagong skyline. So thank you for having me here. Hey everyone, good evening. My name is Sheila. I uh, am the founder and other co-facilitator of Honorary's Book Club. I am a, it's weird to say, like most middle-aged, but like in my mid, almost mid-30s, um, South Asian woman with glasses and shoulder-length hair wearing a gray sweatshirt. And my background is a photo from uh, Sri Lanka. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about after parties with everyone. Just to give a quick synopsis for listeners at home, this is a set of short stories centering experiences of Cambodian Americans in Central Valley and um, really discusses a lot of big, important themes from that diaspora. Um, but there, there are some central through lines in terms of relationships of characters, but it's not like you can't, you can read one and it'd be, you'd be completely fine. So it's that type of set of short stories. Um, so I'm going to open it up and like, this is a huge group and I'm so excited, which means I think people really liked it, but I just want to know what do people think about this, the after parties. Hi, 
I, I loved it. Um, I just loved the way that like this, each story, it seemed like he had so many plates kind of spinning in the air through every story. And you're kind of like, where's this going? And then the, they would end with this paragraph that was like, I just went through and read all the last paragraphs again. And I feel like it could be its own little piece of, I don't know, flash fiction. It's also like, it's almost like a couplet in a sonnet. Like I feel like that last paragraph just does this kind of amazing wow job of, of finishing the stories. And, um, so I just was, I, I just was so impressed with his writing and his transitions between, you know, pop culture and then genocide. And, um, I just, yeah, I, I, I thought it was great. I also loved it. I think he uh, does such a good job of crafting really real feeling people, even if they didn't always remind me of people that I know in my life. Uh, I think it also, um, uh, showed me what a big gap in my uh, historical and current knowledge uh, as far as Cambodian culture and the Cambodian genocide is. So it inspired me to do a little research and I still feel like I have a, a lot of learning to do, but I love it uh, when reading fiction, I get inspired to learn more about something that really happened. Um, and I also loved how different so many of the stories were. They had they had different tones. It was, in some ways, it's hard to believe what a young writer he was when he wrote this because it it read of someone who had lived a whole lot of life. I was also really enraptured by the book with nine short stories. I feel like it, it breezed by through or too quickly. I wanted to spend more time in each of the, the small worlds that were built around the stories. What a crafted writer. Oh my goodness. I, the, the writing just sucked me right in. I will admit that I started the book listening to audio and I listened to maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes. I just wasn't the right time. Wasn't the right minute. I wasn't into the narration. So I stopped listening on audio. Then I restarted the book like a few weeks later. And as soon as I was reading the printed material, I was just like, well, that was dumb to listen to it on audio. For me as a, as a audiobook lover, I just fell more in love with the words and how it was crafted by reading it. And then I did jump and listen to a couple on audio and then I jump back to finishing the rest of the stories and just just brilliant the usage the flow of the sentences it was just lovely you were just like there with these characters and their stories and their families and their experiences and you felt so much and then they like went out the door and then another set of characters came in the room and was you were you were sharing their lives and their stories so I was I was really really happy to read this book and it was again another book I wouldn't have gravitated or even known about except for one of these book discussions. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. Oh, the author died before it was published. I was just like, I need to read what this book is about. What is everybody talking about? So I was glad to have found out about it and read it. Another enjoyable experience here with Unerased. <laughs> I was yeah. so happy to read it. I love short stories too. And the characters were so rich and I think he wrote them so honestly and so interestingly uh, that it was it was really wonderful to read. And then about halfway through the book, I realized, oh, these stories are linked. Uh, and I'm sure we're all going to talk about that. But that was another great part of it because they are kind of independent and kind of linked. So that was that was really, really nice. Yeah, I think it, it gave um, the having the, some of the same characters gave a different depth to them. And, you know, where you saw a different side or a different age of them. Right. Um, yeah, just all, all of that. Um, I didn't even realize he had died until like I, when I was done with it. And I I I was dumbfounded. I, I and then sad. Um, so that was yeah, that was that part was a bummer. But um yeah, some of the other themes were really um, just tough to recognize the the trauma that everyone is facing that has been through this, whose family, and we talked, Emily and I had a little chat earlier, but um, just the generational trauma and what folks were carrying with them from what their parents and possibly grandparents. It's really fascinating. Yeah, I looked um, 
because I read the author blurb and it was referring to him in the past tense. So I looked that up before I started reading the book. And so knowing that he had died of a drug overdose really just kind of um, impacted my reading of the trauma throughout and how um, even the things that weren't personal trauma for him all added to the uh, the weight of expectation and all of these other things that um, causes a lot of people problems in our world today. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed the book and I really enjoyed the writing in the book. Uh, but for me, Lucy, those end things were like little gut punches. Like you'd be kind of reading and feel like it's a fairly not surface level story, but like an A plus B equals C story. And then suddenly you just get a little bit of something that makes it hit home harder. I love this point about reading that last paragraph. I'm going to have to go back and uh, reread them. I listened to the audiobook and I was just like, I kept having to stop doing whatever I was doing because I was so enraptured with the stories. Um, but one of the one of the greatest things that I appreciate about it is that a lot of these narratives coming out of Asian American literature, like where it's like deep diving into people's communities and trauma and things like that have been oftentimes from women's perspectives and written by female authors. And this has been so refreshing and it's so appreciated because I often think about like, what are the men in the community experiencing and how are they being affected by everything? And um, it's not that men don't exist in stories that women write. I think that it's just that I have always been very curious from the perspective of a man writing male characters, like what the that experience is like, you know, because I feel like they can pull from that lived experience in a way. Um, in an interview, uh, I or in a article about him that was written after his death by interviewing people close to him, you know, um, one of the people said that, you know, they could see their lives on these pages, like bits and pieces of things they recognize, which to me, like really resonated with the authenticity or, like, or the, the truthfulness nature of the stories that I felt like there was an inner truth to it that really came out. Um, so I very much appreciated both the representation of like male points of views and masculinity and like the effects of generational trauma on the men in the community, um, as well as just how honest and vulnerable these stories were. I listened to this book this time around, but I read it the first time, I think maybe a few months after it came out. And like uh, Amanda said, just wildly different experiences. Like I don't usually feel like listening and reading are going to be that diametrically opposed, but I also felt like listening to it and maybe it was the narrator style. It almost felt like I was slogging through and I don't, it's not a negative thing, but it felt like the words and the descriptions hung in the air so much more densely than when I was reading it. Um, and I know like I'm, I know I missed on like critical parts of different stories because I was doing other things like I can normally do with audiobooks. And that really speaks to the craft of the author and how, even though it's a short story, how densely packed everything is. Like the, the writing, the imagery, the, the plot creation, the character development. Um, and I, like Fatima was saying, we don't get a lot of, male identified writers discussing trauma, writing it in a fictional way, not trying to like, you see some like doing it in uh, nonfiction and trying to like market it as like, of course you can take to like overcome. But uh, Anthony instead like he gets pulls into the psyche and the zeitgeist of the Cambodian American community for where he's from. And it's, um, you can tell that there's so much love, but also like, 
a real mirror into like what it feels like to be from a community that's so tight knit, but hasn't dealt with any of like the real traumas that are genetically now encoded in them. I thought something that was um, really interesting with the, like with the generational trauma, um, which I think he did a great job with because it's present in every story, but it's also not the whole focus of every story. And there are moments like when, you know, I think I can't remember what story it is, but someone tells his father, like, stop trying to win every argument with the genocide. You know, it's like that that community can speak about it in so many different ways. But one thing I thought that was really interesting was the stories that like the two stories with Matt with Molly and then the end story with the um the nurse and the idea of um like reincarnation as in this actual like embodiment of generational trauma you know she's carrying around the anger of this person who died because that person is living inside of her and and i just thought um i mean i don't know if that connection was meant to be there but it just was so interesting to think about the actual physical weight of feeling this being living inside of you um so i just think like those last stories the way he ended it and then the last story that was such this like like you were saying and the last paragraphs are kind of this gut punch i think the last story was a gut punch and then to finish that story and then go into the acknowledgements and realize that that story was actually his mother. Um, so yeah, I don't really know what my point is just, just like more awe. So. <laughs> was that the one um, where there was a shooting at the playground? That one? Yeah. The, yeah. 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 Yes, I looked that up right away and I was like, oh yeah, I remember in the song. Yeah. Lucy, I did not read the acknowledgments and I feel like I missed a whole couple things there. So when this is done, I'm going to immediately read those three pages. Oh, pity me. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm going to go back and read the last paragraphs too. Just really curious about that. And if you all haven't yet, add to your reading list, uh, his last book um they it's called songs on endless repeat it came out a couple months ago and it's a collection of work that he had published in other magazines or online things but the real gem and heartbreaking part of it is there are also chapters from the novel he was working on and even just reading those chapters by themselves they kind of work like short stories except you do get to keep coming back to the characters and then of course that's all you get you don't get the complete novel but it is worth reading i was when i picked it up i wasn't sure whether or not it would feel empty because it's you know just reaching to find things but it it didn't it of course i wanted more uh but i would add it to the list if you liked these it, they were it was very much worth the read thank you for that hot tip i didn't realize the second like collection had come out um there was a good Code switch episode it's from a while ago and probably like three or four years ago um no it was it was during the pandemic because they were talking about um like the stop aapi hate campaign and um they trace it back to that shooting that school shooting and how it's actually one of the first school shootings that nobody talks about because it targets southeast asian refugee children and that's like an invisible part of our community or like our history because like why do the refugees come <laughs> American interference. Um, and it's like really heartbreaking to recognize like the length of um, public shootings and mass shootings and that this one is like so racially motivated and um, doubly heartbreaking to think about like Anthony's personal connection to it and having to revisit that immediate trauma um, in, in his story. For me, so much of the stories felt almost uh, stifling or I almost had a sense of feeling trapped or unable to escape either the, the legacy of being Cambodian or the expectations of my family or, a re, uh, or another soul that is partly inhabiting my being and my thoughts or trying to prove myself this way or that way it um it's not exactly exhausting but i just felt so stuck no matter what i would do me being 
you know, I'm reading into the book and just feeling what the main characters are going through. It didn't feel like there was a lot of choice or freedom uh, in many of the stories to me. And I I enjoyed the stories, you know, getting that sense uh, because it's conveyed so well. I mean, even when there's like not as many choices in the bigger things, I feel like they exercised a lot of like agency in in smaller moments or in moments like I just keep thinking about them like working at the video store and watching movies in the back. Um and and, and I don't know, there there's something really powerful about that where it's like it's different from their parents generation where they were like working 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 and it's non-stop working and you don't let up and I don't know if like leisure of any kind was valued or not so much valued as like afforded to them or like they felt that they could afford themselves and so to to have these characters perhaps dissociate a little bit perhaps you know um I don't know, just like take a break from everything else or suppress like a, a reality in a way or reject reality in a way. Um, I, I thought that was really, really cool to see. And and then also their reliance on each other while they did that, because there was always that connection, whether it's like through love or sex or or just like companionship. One relationship that I found really interesting um, was the the father son relationship in the shop, um, and part of it is they were relying on each other, you know, but they weren't communicating with each other because they didn't realize that the the father was only trying to make a success out of the business so that the son wouldn't have to work at the business. Meanwhile, the son thinks he should be trying to make the business a success. Um, and I don't know where I'm going with that. I just, it struck me as an interesting thing that we're, we're good at forming our entire being around what we think other people are doing as opposed to just asking them if that's their intention. That felt like the most classic scenario of, of like, I'm just going to make all these assumptions. And this is like the immigrant parent experience of, of I'm doing these things and I don't have to verbalize it. And you should just know. Like you should know and you should go along with it, which to me is just it's it's hilarious because uh, it causes so much hurt feelings. And yet uh, it it just persists regardless of culture. I know I've faced it in, in my culture, but um, yeah, it just seems very persistent. One of my favorite stories was um, Super King Son, Spores Gan, or whatever the full title is. I love that we were just like dropped in the middle of this grocery store and you could just smell the stench coming off of him. And then the young kids just going on about Batman and this new really great player. And then to have him like battle the kid at the end and just see how he has this internal struggle that's just like coming out as he's like battling this, this new kid, like playing badminton. There was so much going on in that story, but I just, you could just really feel like his pain and his suffering and his like struggle to do good, but also offer and provide the service for people in the community. And I also love that with the grocery store setting is sort of like this everyday spot that people need to come to and try to get their, you know, expired canned goods. Something just really grabbed me. That was, that was, the, that was the first story that I read with the book in not audio. And that's when I was like, okay, you need to read the book after this. I was really drawn towards that one. I was I was fascinated by the the wedding one. Um it's just how all the different aspects of it. And I was confused though about, and maybe you can explain, or maybe it didn't mean anything, but just how bride was 
in capital letters or the not bride, the the famous singer, famous singer was in capital letters referred to her her and maybe maybe it was bride out there were some some words that were in caps and um I didn't know why but um but I found that it was just interesting to hear about what the expectation was for the gift giving and and like how they each you know knew or what kind of reputation they were going to have if if it was found out they didn't give an adequate uh you know bunch of cash and uh, it just I thought it was real interesting I just I could just see it and then even the like the after party um just I don't know even though it's not they're not people I would have I hung out with but I could just picture the kind of shenanigans that happen after a wedding and all the um stuff that you know the the drama that happens it, I just I thought I got a kick out of it I read the the capital letters. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to change, so you should go to Lucy. Oh, I was going to say, I just read the capital letters as like things that were being emphasized maybe by um, people putting on the wedding or like the older generation being like the famous singer and it's gotcha, about the yeah, bride. Yeah. And that's kind of how I felt they were, but I, I could be um, wrong. Yeah, that, that I kind of thought that's what it was, but I didn't know if it sounded different when they were reading it, but uh, you know in the audio but i think for me oh sorry Lisa. Here, no sorry. I'm, I'm good um i think it's so interesting hearing the different stories that resonate with different people because i enjoyed the book as a whole but the one that i keep coming back to in my brain is uh, the one at the care facility with the the dying relative and the woman who was both happened to be related but also one of the paid caregivers um I think it did such a good job of bringing the complicated relationship with death, whether it is as someone in family, uh, close family, or not as close family, or as the people who are being paid by these families to be there close and do the work. And maybe part of it is I, uh, in a different sort of place, but I worked in senior living for a while. So I've seen it from both sides there and it felt very accurate that balance of your caring you do care about the people you care for and you also recognize that some of them are real challenges to to be with and I just thought that it was handled so beautifully and it was one of those very clear show don't tell stories where you could see the that the family m member who comes in at the end who's you know really bothering uh, the the protagonist of that story uh, by being there not caring or by giving her the food that she wasn't supposed to get. But that's also someone who is seeing the loss of a loved one. I just thought it was told very thoughtfully and accurately. I agree. I, that whole, I could visualize all of the, you know, the whole nursing home and the staff and just the, what it would be like and, the stuff that people deal with in those settings when they work. And also the the daughter that, you know, just came in and was judging, you know, the her cousin, basically. Um, yeah, that was good. I think, too, when Lucy mentioned the last paragraphs, and then with that one, what's interesting is in it, um, with the after... Mayang dies and then there's that necklace that she take that she still has the nurse has and then she's going to give it to the little girl um and then she says the part of her wants to throw it off into the murky polluted water right through california through the pacific so that no one but me has to live this burden part of me wonders if the new generation should be allowed some freedom from the dreams of the dead but i'm also tired and don't see any other path so it just kind of that little idea floats through like most of the stories in the book of like the dream of the the past of the dead of the people who are alive and carrying that trauma with them and then the younger folks who are still here trying to like get beyond that but also are living it in within it themselves with their relatives yeah i think that paragraph really encapsulates how i feel about so many of the stories and i and also what i said earlier they they kind of make me tired you feel tired from working 
or tired from thinking or tired from other people. At least that's how I read so many of the stories and the reaction that I had. Um, it Life feels really tiring to me. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else felt like that or not. It it did it felt like there was a lot of pressure to just to to live you know to a lot of work hard work um, not a lot of fun just in the, the quick recollection that I that I came away with but yeah some of the times I was like oh man can't they catch a break I feel like that kind of highlights how successful he was at creating this book because you really are able to feel the the weight of that generational trauma and expectation and not just in a broad there was a genocide type frame but how it's actually plays out in the day-to-day -day in specific ways. That is interesting because they don't go into a lot of like historical or tell stories. Oh, my grandma went through this. My parents went through that. It's just people who are here today. They're living in California, all of these Cambos, as he says, and you can still feel whatever happened, whatever happened over there. You still feel, they feel that their children feel it, their children's children. And so you can just, that resonates through all of the people that are in the book, just try to, to live their daily lives. And I, I kind of, I liked that a lot. It also made it darker or more mysterious that this, you know what happened. If you're an adult reading the book, you know, like a couple sentences about what had happened to people in Cambodia, but it's interesting just to hear like the aftermath of the people, the after party, so to say, of like what's, ha what's happening today. Yeah, I was uh, embarrassed. I, I I didn't know the or if I did, I didn't know about a camp Cambodian genocide. Um, and so yeah, I was kind of shocking to be like, uh, you know, when I looked looked it up and realized how little I know. Um, yeah, about things like that. I was lucky enough to in a European history class in college or in high school, have a teacher who had seen the killing fields and really liked the movie and so showed it to us. And uh, while it really didn't have much to do with what we were supposed to be learning about, I'm so thankful because otherwise I would have made it quite a long ways without ever hearing about it. I'm struck by how much I feel let down by um, the historical part of my education. I feel like there are big swaths of my education where, oh, they did a good job. But my word, how little I learned about any country that wasn't the United States all the way through high school. And I was a learner and I didn't learn so much. Um, it's a good reminder to keep keep searching for those reasons to learn, even if there's not homework that tells you you have to, because let alone all the things that keep happening, there, there's a lot to fill in the blanks in the past. And I think that even the history of the United States is at risk. So just throwing that out there. Um, you know, I think part of the reason why he doesn't do the whole like, well, my grandmother did this, my grandmother, you know, like you're providing that in a super contextualized way is because I don't think he was writing for outsiders. I think he was very much writing for those in his community and those who would like get it and know and and you either got it or you didn't. And I actually really appreciated that because I think it decenters that that imagined audience to be to be someone who is not Cambodian, you know, um uh or yeah, I, I appreciated having that as an example. Someone who wasn't over explaining everything. Yeah, it's almost like we were invited. We were invited into that neighborhood, that community, mm -hmm. that experience. So it felt 
it felt good to be there to spend time with these. There was another book that we read for this book club a couple of years ago. It was a poetry book. Mm -hmm. There was a woman who went to a museum and it had to do with like it was a stuff. school and then a museum. Yeah, that's that's yeah. where I learned Same. so that's much about this say. genocide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was, and I was kind of blind to it before then. And then we talked about this for that book as well. But that was when I kind of read up. I didn't read up on it. I couldn't reiterate all these facts. But I was able to read um, the basics of what had happened to everybody. And so that that book really stuck too. Mm -hmm. what, what was that title? Um, it was... Nailed the um, evening. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah uh, I Nailed the Evening Hangs On by Monica Sock. And I just put the link in, in our chat. Um, but I think that was the year that I think like half the books were just like, cool, Henry Kissinger is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I know that I've been very lucky to have been able to travel in Southeast Asia and Fatima's lived in South Asia and has traveled, traveled a lot throughout the region for her, her job at that point. And that really, in a good way, like you've, you're forced to ask questions like, what is this place? What is the history? And then as soon as you start reading, you're like, wait a second. <laughs> um, and that's a part of like what inspired me to start this book club almost six years ago now is the, it's not just like that in publishing, there's not a lot of diversity. It's even if there is diversity, there's like focus on like a few specific communities or authors from specific communities. And then we lose out on stories from other cultures and other places that and other experiences that really should be in our understanding of how we operate like the Cambodian like the Cambodian American experience um the uh, we read um I, I can't remember the name um spark like stars no not spark like stars the one before that sorry uh Fatma was the name of it the light from yes. uncommon stars yeah thank you yes we read two star books back to back um and there's a, it there is um a very strong reference to the cambodian american donut like economy that exists like in that book that's a plot point and if you're not familiar with that then you lose out on like that richness of that storyline so um fatima and i like purposefully try to find books that give that texture um and we're glad that this book really hit hit it on the nail for everyone. There's a documentary called um, Donut King, which is about um, sort of the person who, the, the Cambodian who like kind of built this franchise of, of donut shops. Um, and they also just watched another really good documentary called Bad Axe, which is about a, a Cambodian refugee who he has a restaurant, not, a, I think it started as a donut shop, but they changed it into a restaurant in Bad Axe, Michigan, um, during the pandemic and dealing with, um, the general population and their viewpoints in, in Bad Axe. I highly recommend it. It's, um, it was interesting to watch it so recently, like when at the same time that I was reading these stories and kind of have that dual experience. I, I've, I saw that and I saw the the authors came. I forgot they were Cambodian, but yeah, you guys, you need to watch it. And I'd love to go up to their restaurant too. Um, yeah. Good, good film. <clears throat> I'm like Googling and bookmarking. <laughs> Thank you for those recommendations. I, I always appreciate that. Yeah. I was curious what everyone thought of the story human development about San Francisco and the tech industry and the relationship. Um, that was one of my favorites in the book. And I really, I just loved the, the tension. There was so much tension in that relationship between just general outlook and just attitudes and energy and age and um honesty i, I thought it was a, a great story i really enjoyed it there was also a little dig on the word um uh 
what's the what's that common word that people disrupt <laughs> because i think his boyfriend used the word disrupt at one point and he said oh no not that word <laughs> so i i really like that story a lot yeah that was I, one of my my favorites too yeah i, I just i loved the um like the way that they were connecting or not connecting, but then there was like these sweet moments in the end. And that's a really good one. Like I felt like that one, you get to the end and it's just sort of this beautiful encapsulation of all the moments that have happened in the story and also pulling in like Moby Dick. And um, right. yeah, I just thought the story was a fun journey, you know, just it kind of took you all over the place. And again, I'm just like in awe of the fact that he was such a young person writing all of this because I can't imagine being that observant and that like insightful and just, yeah, like understanding people that deeply is really, really impressive. Well, that too, one of the characters was named Anthony and uh, went to Stanford. I did like... Um, him texting with his twin sister and hearing these two different, you know, bi-coastal stories of like how their lives were not, they were doing good things, but then they were still like disconnected, but connected because they were twins. I like that little bit of that familialness that was still coming through, even though they were still trying to live or were experiencing separate lives at that point. When I finished the the last story and then read the um, acknowledgments, like I was just like, wow, but also just felt so deeply sad because, because this person has wrote this amazing collection. And like, as you were just saying, Fatima has that ability to observe so many different kinds of lives and people. And then that's, we get this and that other collection that just came out and then, you know, you, um, that's it. And it's, so it, it just like, I don't know, it just made me really sad to, to finish it and be like, wait, now I'm done with those. <laughs> like I can read them again, but it's over, you know? Yeah, definitely, definitely a really big tragedy. Um, just, yeah. I, um, one thing that really stood out to me was like the use of humor um, all throughout the books. And I'm, I'm just curious if people picked up on that or like what you thought the impact it had on the stories, because they are difficult, challenging topics. Um, I just I think for me, like the humor hit the most in the Super King story where the kids oh my god the kids just like reminded me of the way that like kids would be in our neighborhood growing up like kind of just like congregating around an adult you know a space that's not even meant for them to congregate around but they're just hanging out and making fun and um i, I don't know i th i just thought it was so so great <laughs> and it made me feel very warm and like close to the stories and the characters. Um, but I'm wondering how, like, uh, how um, that the humor affected you all. I I thought it was, there were a lot of funny parts and I mean, I can see what, it, you know, yeah, just some of the casual, can't think of any specific, but just, yeah, like with the, um, the tech guy and his, how he was responding to him and um, his cousin, the very first story and, and also his sexuality made kind of fun of himself and his, the way he is. Um, so yeah, I thought I, it was, there, there were some lighthearted parts to it. Yeah. I, I liked how real the humor was too. I mean, it, it like the, I was, laughing at, at a lot of it but then he's make there's just no part that he wasn't willing to bring humor into even like there's um i think it's in human development when he's talking about like 
on looking on Grinder and being like, no, I don't feel like being a bottom and being colonized by a, a white man. I, you know, just like little things like that. And I, I just, I don't know. Yeah, it was, it, it was, it was funny throughout the whole thing. I did. Um, I was listening to uh, like a podcast of uh, people who knew him, and I guess he started as or he wanted to be a stand up comic. And hearing that, I was like, oh yeah, that makes that makes sense. I see that coming through. Yeah, I found humor throughout it as well. Just like small things, but constant. They're kind of lingering or sitting on top of the table in every each of the stories, which just added that layer of, of more humanness to each story. And when you had like such serious things going on with some of the families were in the background, I really, I picked up on the humor and I thought it was a really, really important addition to the writing and to the stories that he was sharing. The one, the story, I think it was the first story, the donut shop, the girls and the man that was coming in and yeah, all that, just even the descriptions of the way the mom was behaving or the way she was, you know, working, just all that. You could just, you could just see, it did feel like you were, you were there. You could, you were an observer in this, in each unique setting that, that he described. And I think one of the funniest scenes was in uh, what's it, what's it called? We were we could be princes, though the wedding party, right? Yeah. <laughs> is when the I think it's the famous singer, right, makes up the story about is either the bride or the famous singer makes up the story to lift the wallet out of the guy's pants from the uncle's pants. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, sure. that, it was so cinematic and funny. Uh, I love that. Yeah. That story just was hilarious too. Just all the, um, what sort of hijinks. Yeah. Hijinks. Cool. I like the connection with the two brothers and at the end they're just like sitting outside. I don't know if, I don't know if they're smoking together and then they mention like, why don't we talk? We should go bowling. <laughs> After, in the middle of this like chaotic wild night. Mm -hmm. I also love that their names were Marlon and Bond. After yes. James Bond and Marlon Brando. <laughs> that was funny. Yeah. It made me wonder if that's a common, you know, kind of thing that Cambo people would name their kids after, you know, I don't know, or if it's just how that worked out. But um, yeah, I couldn't tell you. But yeah. in Bangladesh, people tend to choose like a lot of nicknames based on just words they like or so. Like I have an aunt who's called Jelly and another one who is called Bubbly. And it's just like they, they love these words and, and it's personally meaningful in some way. And so they adopt it not as their official name. Usually it's very much like unofficially, but sure. in this case, yeah, which is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're coming up at the top of the hour. I'm curious if you have any last thoughts or anything that you want to share that you were not able to share tonight. Okay. Um, thank you all so much for the recommendations. I'm going to follow up on all of them, including his uh, um, incomplete novel and other collection and the two documentaries. Next month, we are reading um, a memoir, Hijab Butch Blues by Lamia H. Uh, this is a Muslim author who was born uh, to a South Asian family and then moved uh, to the Middle East and then to America. And it explores um, queerness and that growing up as a queer person, as well as relationship to faith, particularly the Islamic faith. Um, and it really does some deep dives into the Quran, which is just for me, even as a Muslim person, it was really, really wonderful and incredible to read and enlightening to read this new interpretation of some of the stories from the Quran. So I think that um, you all will probably enjoy it, especially since next month is also Ramadan. So um, it just kind of all working out. So I hope you will join us for that. 
Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for this. This is a, another great pick. I'm so glad I read this book. Cool. All right. Take care, everyone.